Hello everyone and welcome to this podcast. This interview with Tim was recorded some time ago during the pandemic. At that time, Tim was Resilience and Business County Manager of the UK Post Office. I found this to be a very interesting conversation, very insightful, particularly for those in the government sector. What it takes to implement business continuity in a government organization and what the UK Post therefore managed to achieve during the pandemic. Some very nice insightful learnings and comments from this session. He makes a fair point. Rarely, if ever, do you get to work in a single organization with retail, finance, logistics, government, and with a social purpose. So sounds like a whole bunch of wonderful things to do. Contribute to society as well as sustain yourself and touch lives of different people in many different ways. Tim has recently taken on a full-time role as Head of Resilience Planning with Booba Global, which is an insurance entity. Tim, we wish you all the best. So without further ado, everyone, I bring you Tim Ahmed. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a great conference. I hope you're uh, learning lots from some set of of amazing speakers with some great subjects. Um, I'd like to spend now 20 odd minutes with you talking about how one fantastic reaction was managed across the pandemic uh, in the UK post office, uh, what we did and the approaches we took, the lessons we learned, and hopefully engage you with some questions later on. Um, So what we're going to cover today, I just want to uh, look at really um, why isn't resilience embedding into companies as it should be? I've been speaking at conferences now for 30 odd years and for all of that time what I hear is we are not embedding, we're not uh, getting the buy-in we want um, and we're not getting the support we want and I I just don't think it's acceptable in today's uh, world. So I want to talk about where we are and how we did approach that uh, in in, in our successes Um, and also really were some companies not prepared? How could you not have been prepared um, if you were working in this industry? It's our job. Um, I want to talk to you really about the the incredible approach we took to keeping 9,000 plus branches open every day throughout the pandemic. Um, So who am I? Why am I talking to you? And what have I done today to uh, make you worthwhile listening to me? Uh, I've been around for a long time. I was one of the original people in this industry. I was in it in the 1980s. Um, I was working in the financial sector in the early 1990s when we had the huge IRA terrorist attacks back in those days. And I have been through an awful lot of events all over the world uh, with an awful lot of companies. I've been lucky enough to work in all cross sectors of organizations all around the world, from South Africa to Singapore to America to Canada to Finland and across the UK. Um, I've written some of the original plans for some of the biggest organizations in Great Britain and around the world as well. Um, So I, I, I have had experience. I do roughly know what I'm talking about. Um, I've also been an innovator as well. I was there before the BCI, when it used to be called Survive, uh, before we changed it into that and made it a a more regulatory body. Um, I've I've run the first benchmarking in the financial sector in the UK. Um, I ran the first ever citywide exercise um, across the whole of Manchester was the first place we did that. And I created the, and I wrote the good practice guidelines as well. Um, So again, again, I've got a lot of experience, a lot of depth and knowledge and um, what I've got frustrated about over the years mainly is that we repeat the same mistakes. We don't learn very often from what we've done. I see the new Bank of England uh, operational resilience regulations coming in and the OCIR. And I think this is nothing new. It's not complicated. So why are people thinking it's difficult when it's something we do that's that's simple and and we should be doing it already? Um, I developed a a unique approach to retail this year within the post office. I also ran the the government's UK relocation of all of uh, 50% of our civil servants outside the M25 for the 51 days of the Olympics. Um, So I've I've been around a little bit. Um, I've done a few things. Uh, I've helped mentor huge amounts of people. Many of the speakers here I've worked with or I've mentored into the industry. But let's talk about post office and who are post office. Well, in the UK, this will mean more to, to people from overseas, but we're not the Royal Mail. We used to be. There used to be one big organization, and uh, then we were split off a number of years ago. And we don't do all those things you may have seen on the television that you think we're, that, 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 that is us. So what do we do? Well, we have 11,500 branches in the United Kingdom. That is the largest retailer in Europe, the largest single retailer in Europe. And I'll repeat that because it's worth knowing. That's how big we are. 99.7% of the UK population is within three miles or five kilometers of a branch anywhere in the country. Um, And we cover a huge amount of the population. 
we now do 90% of um, banking customers as well. And I'll talk about that a bit later. And we, we represent 31 banks in the United Kingdom for their retail and their business retail banking. All of it can be done over our counters. And we, we as post office, we're open from 7 a.m. until 11 p.m. and seven days a week in many, many cases. So the service levels and the, the delivery levels are huge with over 170 products on sale. We cover everything from retail to banking to government services to logistics, the whole lot. But one of our key areas is the support of vulnerable customers. There are over 1 million people in the United Kingdom who cannot access money anywhere except through the post office, be that their pensions or their support benefits or any access to money. They cannot use ATMs apart from ours and they rely wholly on us for any access to cash. So we're very big. We're very wide in our scope of products and our delivery of services. And we're one of the most trusted companies in Great Britain. People rely on the post office. They believe that it will be, give them a, a good level of service and it will be honest and ethical in the way it treats them. We're part of the critical national infrastructure of Great Britain um, and we're dedicated to that under the security services. So we have a right that we have a need to be operational in certain areas. And more and more often now we're becoming the last bank standing in 4,000, 4,000 villages in the United Kingdom. We are the last bank standing with the only access to money in those villages. And we're working with the Bank of England on certain services to ensure that the flow of cash across the country is maintained. We're over 300 years old and we're still growing. We've been around a long time. So in COVID, we couldn't stop. We had to be there. We had to deliver money to all of those branches on a daily basis. Imagine the logistics side of that. And we kept that going. We had to collect money because many businesses on the high street were closing down and wanted to close out their accounts and wanted to, uh, sorry, not their accounts, that were the money they were holding in the businesses and they wanted to get it banked. And for many, that meant there was only us. An awful lot of the main street banks either shut or reduced their hours to nine till two or 10 till two in certain cases. And it just didn't meet the needs of the businesses on the high street. And we were more and more relied upon. We had to support and keep on supporting those vulnerable customers. There is nowhere else they can go. And we had to meet the banking obligations of those 31 banks that we'd committed to do as well. And so much more. And there was things we hadn't expected. As the high street closed around us, as retailers closed, as you saw across the whole of the world and across Europe particularly, as lockdown came in and many, many businesses and pubs and bars and restaurants closed, they, they all needed to reduce their money holdings. And when they came to us, as retailers closed and the lack of access to goods increased, we kept on trading. We kept on being there. We had to be there. And for 3,000, 4,000 villages, we were the only ones that people could go to. It quickly became clear that of the vulnerable people we supported, the 1 million vulnerable people, most of those fell into the UK government's level of shielding. This was an age groups that uh, the government had stated where you had to stay indoors. You could not go out. and uh, You had to be supported. And that became very clear that a huge amount of those 1 million people, their only access to cash now, wasn't possible. So we had to find a way to make sure they could get cash to them rather than them coming to us or to find a unique way that could support them accessing cash. And we had to work with government departments and logistics and other areas to make sure that could happen. One of the things we hadn't anticipated, I don't think anybody had, was parcel volumes went through the roof. As everybody was sitting at home, they were all trading on Amazon. They were clearing out their houses and eBaying all their own goods. And the volumes of parcels exceeded any Christmas limits we'd ever had. And Christmas is always our busiest time of year. So suddenly, when everything else was reduced and people were reducing capacity, we had more demand and more business than we had ever seen before. And that put pressure on our people that we'd never seen before. The post office runs a franchise model. So the vast majority of the 11,500 branches that we run in normal times, we don't own. We have a relationship with the people on a franchise basis. So in their, it's up to their decisions of what they did. And we work to support them in every way possible. But for them, it's their own business. So they were very keen to keep going as well. So what do we do? Well, as I said at the beginning, this isn't my first rodeo. I've been around for a while. And therefore, we have seen it all before. And if you work in this industry, haven't seen it all before or read about it all before, what have you been doing? What have you heard at these conferences? This was my fourth pandemic. And for most people in this industry that have been around for over a decade or so, it would be multiple pandemics that they've been through. We've done this before. We've prepared for this before. For the last big one, the avian flu, which they may not have arrived, but we thought they were coming. I was working for a high street, a massive high street retailer then with a pharmaceutical edge. And we worked on our whole logistics of how we would get into infected towns, lockdown towns. We were using those terms years ago. This is not new and no one should have been caught out. 
So in, in December 2019, when we heard of it coming out of China, we started to look at where we were. We looked at our assumptions. We looked at our strategies. We ran our scenarios that we've had in place for years to look at our lockdown, to look at our cut down on staffing levels, and to look at our third parties and how they could be affected as well. There was nothing that we hadn't done before and nothing that nobody else should not have done before. And if, if you haven't, why not? What were you doing? So by January, our board was, GE is what we call our board, our leadership, chief executive, COO, CIO, et cetera. Um, they were fully on board. They were fully briefed. They were fully up to speed and they knew what we were doing and why we were doing it. And in February, we ran more exercises to try and identify further gaps or further risks that we needed to mitigate. By the end of February, we were ready to go. And we stood up a rapid response team then of a cut down uh, uh, operational segment of focusing on what keeps the light on in the company. Not all of us keep the lights on. There are people in the company that actually are the key areas. And again, this, we should know all this. If you don't know this, what have you been doing? And we knew who kept the lights on. We knew the four or five areas that if they run, the company runs. And you should know that. And you should know what isn't in that as well. So we stood those up for daily nine o'clock meetings, 9.15 actually to give people time to check their early morning emails, um, to actually see where we were, what was happening. And to make sure that our turnover, our reporting, our PPE management, our health and safety reporting, our staffing levels, our people, were all already coming on board. We knew very quickly, and this is not a direct criticism, please don't take it as that, that we couldn't rely upon the government for fast response. We couldn't rely upon the government for detailed response or future planning or for them to be constant. They were going to change. So we had to plan selfishly for what we needed and to put our plans in place and start to think about us before the government came up with what they wanted to layer across that, which needed interpretation in a lot of cases. We'd seen this with SARS, avian, swine, Ebola. This wasn't new. We'd been here before. So we knew what we were talking about. Uh, and this is one of the things I mentioned in the beginning about why weren't companies prepared. I think a lot of companies plan for what happened last and not what's going to happen next or the generic what the bad things are. Too many, we can guarantee that next year there will be conference after conference on and, and consultant after consultant selling pandemic plan solutions because it does the last thing that happened. Um, this is always the case. Um, whenever a terrorist attack comes up, everybody turns towards that. But why is this happening? Why are so many plans scenario based instead of generic in terms of what the bad thing is? What well, we'd always looked upon, what I've learned through the years and years of doing floods, terror, mass electricity loss avian flus, all the different types of huge scenarios that I've been through, is that scenario focus isn't the way forward. Focus on what hurts you, what has to be resilient, design the resilience into that, and train the people to make sure that you can respond to whatever the bad thing was. What actually happened here? What actually happened here is we, everybody across the world, primarily lost access to their buildings through choice or through government instruction or through sickness. We lost a small, and it was never very large in most organizations, a small number of staff to either shielding or to um, sickness. And a lot of those that shielding could work at home. But we had time to plan for this. It wasn't instant reaction. We knew it was coming. So therefore, it wasn't an urgent crisis. We knew we were going to lose access to our buildings. Our IT in the main was going to be resilient. We did learn that certain nations don't have as resilient IT as us, and we've outsourced to certain countries that when they went home, it wasn't as good for us. We should have already known that. Why was anyone caught out with that? We, we weren't because we are a wholly, wholly British organization. Um, we, we were lucky, but others were. But you should have known it. We know that um, in this case, we may lose some people. We may, we will lose access to our buildings. We won't lose our IT systems. And customer, dem customer demand in certain cases will drop, in certain cases will increase. We also have to make sure we understand what our third parties' responses are as well. So early on in January and February, we were li liaising and working with all of our key third parties that we depended upon to make sure that they had their solutions in place as well. One of the big things I've learned through all the crises I've been through and, and, and through my experience of actually implementing solutions is stop talking about it, do it. Stop planning, do it. Stop writing incredibly complex documents with lots and lots of four-letter acronyms or three-letter acronyms in them and do it. Because in the end, nobody actually cares about your plans or your paperwork. They want to know what the solutions are. And if you've got the solutions in place and you've trained and practiced them over and over again, it becomes second nature to people to do these. And that's what they want to know. They don't want to know how clever you can write your documents. And that's what you've got to focus on is, 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 is making sure it's embedded in your organization. 
It's what people do that keeps an organization going, not how good your documentation is. We had embedded it for years over many, many different scenarios we had embedded it. We had been working with the leaders in each business area for them to understand that this was their strategy, their plan, and that they needed to own it. And it was them that needed it. And the benefit was to them. We did a, we're salesmen. We, all of us people here, we should be salesmen. We should be selling and embedding and making sure they understand why. And when they've got it, they understand why it's theirs. And they should be nagging us for improvement, nagging us for testing, nagging us for challenge. And, and, it, and, and then they take it over, they improve it, and they turn it into their own cultural way of working with it. And there will be bits in it that annoy you as a central BCP or resilience manager and say, that's not how I actually want it. But now it works for them, and it's them that's needed. So this is what we've done. And we had ownership right across the board at the operational level who knew how to pick things up and do things. And through lots of minor real incidents, we'd actually been able to uh, prove this, and therefore we were ready to go. Give people the confidence to do it. Don't undermine them. Don't challenge them. Don't continually go up the chain to, to get reassurance. Train your board, your GEs or whatever you call them, your executives, so that they know that it works, that they have confidence in you and your operational teams. So they don't need to, to second guess everything or, or challenge everything. Practice, rehearse, demonstrate, and show that it works. And we had done that and what we had in place worked. So two days before the UK announced lockdown, we got all our staff home. We had a couple of very senior managers who weren't keen on this, but we uh, met the, the, the executive in the room and we took them through it, myself and the head of the health and safety and a couple of others. And we took them through the room as to why, and we got them all on board. And from the top down, leading by example, we got everybody home. And everybody using either uh, work equipment or Microsoft 365 could access all that they needed to. People thought it was impossible to get all our call centers working at home before this. And in other exercises, we found we believed it'd be very difficult. We did it. We did it before lockdown. We ran 100% of our call centers at all times at home without any gaps. In fact, we ran them so well, other companies came to us to help them with their call centers because we were running at, at, at full capacity without any issues. Nothing faltered. Our cash got to the branches. Our branches stayed open. We kept supporting the people we needed to do. And many of the postmasters, as they were open, were able to give extra support into the communities because they were working. We never dropped below 9,000 branches open up to seven days a week across the whole of the year. And we haven't dropped it below that. It was an extraordinary response, an extraordinary reaction. And keeping those sort of numbers, we planned for much, much greater impact. But our people were so good, they kept it going. We kept 100% of all operational levels across offices open. And what was really interesting was with our call centers working at home, we were just as efficient as before. In fact, our six levels dropped because morale was actually up initially. People got tired across the year, but initially people were stronger working at home than they were in the office. And we were doing a, more, a better job. We had to stop people working longer hours because they were so bored. They were working into the evenings. We didn't want them to. Parcel volumes exceeded Black Friday, exceeded Christmas, and we had to uh, incredible volumes that we were trying to manage, but we kept on going, working with Royal Mail to make sure the movements kept, our parcels kept moving. <sighs> Why did it go so well? Well, we'd done all the usual planning, all the stuff that you, we, we read about, all the standards and all the uh, regulatory stuff and all the stuff that's coming out from the Bank of England, the PRA now on, on things that's expected. We'd done all that. Of course we had the impacts and the risks, etc. How much of that is to tick a box? What we had done is got everybody into the believing it, into believing it was theirs. We got everybody into taking it on board. And I'm a strong believer that sometimes a, a strong BC manager can be the problem because you are the excuse they don't take the ownership. We are the excuse they don't take the ownership. We are the excuse that they don't think they have to do it because there's someone central that does this for them. And I very quickly made it clear I wasn't doing it for them. I would help, empower, train, teach, and, and challenge but in the end, it was going to be theirs. And I would coordinate and facilitate, but in the end, it was going to be theirs. And that's what we've done so well that when this came to, to pass, it, it happened very well and very quickly. We had complete trust from our gold team. Um, they believed in what our silver team could do. And I report up to them and I tell them what's happening. And it was, in, in fact, because things were going so smoothly, there was more of a challenge of almost, I don't believe you going so well. And there was a worry that we were uh, missing something because we didn't have the problems people were expecting, but that was because of our rehearsing and because of what we got in place. The silver team was fully empowered and it felt confident in its own ability to do things as well. It didn't react nervously and that went very well as well. 
I'm also a strong believer that the longer you stay in crisis, the more, more people believe you're in a crisis. So we got out of the crisis mode very, very quickly. In fact, we stood down the crisis teams by the end of March. Now, I know certain companies are still running their crisis teams up to October. By the end of March, we handed it over to a project team who could create dashboards and could do much more in-depth reporting. And they could also bring in other people who weren't keep the lights on people to get involved in uh, the discussions where we'd been purely focused on keeping the operational going. Having taken it out of crisis and handing it over to that sort of role, we could have longer meetings, we could have more detailed reports, and it wasn't a crisis anymore. It was a part of business as usual being reported in a different way. I can only recommend you get out of crisis as fast as you can. In our resilience in design, that helped as well. We'd thought about this before. One of the things we built the year before with nothing to do with this, but it was brilliantly related. We designed what we called a post office on wheels, which was a branch that was fully mobile and deployable in, uh, on, on a phone call. It'd be there plugged into dirty electric power and working the next day with safes and uh, IT and registers and the full ability to run a full capacity of an operation anywhere. We could put it in a church hall. We could put it into a town hall. We could put it into anywhere. And if we'd lost a branch, we could make this happen. That helped. We practiced home working and it was well known. That helped. Um, productivity remained the same, which shocked people. People thought it would drop, but it didn't because people were comfortable at home and they could access with the tools such as this, Zooms or Teams to, to get the information across. We'd also liaise with our third parties hugely and our stakeholders to build the confidence in what they were doing, what we were doing, so that we didn't have to start doing that at the time. People knew what we were going to do. And our HR were excellent in changing policies very quickly to enable the different ways of working and some of the things we hadn't thought about. So what was the key lessons we learned? It's about people, not plans. Get the people on board, get the people trained, get the people know what they're doing, and it will work. Trust your people. Don't challenge them. Don't undermine them. Don't double think them. Don't ask them to justify everything. They know their job. Practice, practice, practice. I've been saying that for 30 years. Rehearse and practice and train and people will know what to do on the day. Get away from that traditional way of thinking if it's always been that way. It's a wrong way of thinking. Open your minds. Be imaginative. Don't be constrained by the past. What a lot of people did see in the pandemic was new ways of thinking. Are we going back? Will we go back to offices? Will we go back to the old-fashioned ways of working? Why are we saying go back? Why not go forward in a better way instead of the go back is such a negative term? And will things change? Yes, they will. What, what will we learn from this? Will work ever, re, 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 area recovery ever be needed again? Where, um, and people will say, well, we've got regulatory needs. Uh, we have to be in a place where the, a regulator says we must operate from. We'll challenge the regulator then. Don't, challenge, don't say I have to because. Challenge the regulator to say, look, we're in a new world now. Can't we operate differently? And work with them to find solutions of what they need to enable people to work anywhere. So if something that, like this happens, we have resilience in design all the time. And finally, if your bands aren't embedded, if your people aren't empowered, if your people don't know how to pick this up and just do it, are we doing our job right? Take a look and look at ourselves. Are we doing our job right? And have we done enough to get off us and into them? And this shouldn't that be our main aim? Look, that's it. Thank you very much. I know it's a quick ramble through and I hope I covered all the points. I'm really, really happy to take as many questions as you like. I, I love the challenge. I love the debate and I love trying to be a little bit controversial now and then. But for me, business continuity and resilience is really, really simple. It's very, very simple. It's common sense. It's just a lot of common sense in a very short period of time. And a big focus for, focus for us is to make it work. Just make it work. You've got my email there. You can get me on LinkedIn anytime. Very happy to speak to anyone. I'm really happy to take questions. I hope you have a great conference. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Tim, for your presentation. I personally found it to be very insightful. Lots of learnings, lots of good points, and particularly inspirational for those who are trying to implement business continuity in the government sector. As you said, a social enterprise, but touching the lives of many people in many other ways. And importantly, committed not just to business continuity, but to sustainability of the organization. Thanks so much, Tim, once again for your time. And to all those who watch this video, I hope you found it insightful. You have a good day. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.